Um, so welcome, welcome everyone. Today's webinar, we are having Kevin Carroll from um, RA Black Book. We're going to talk about texting compliance and what you need to know to avoid fines, what you need to know in order to market properly, legally. Kevin's going to dive into that. He's the director of sales for REI Black Book. He's worked with small and medium-sized businesses for a very long time um, in sales and marketing systems. So if you're a real estate investor, um, this is going to be great for you in order to build your uh, base of leads. So we're definitely going to be helping you implement those strategies in order to do that efficiently and legally so you don't get yourself into trouble. Right. We, is that I see Kevin nodding his head. Okay, awesome. So thank you for coming to this event. We have some other events coming up that you are definitely going to uh, take advantage of. Hopefully, we have our tax free income for life webinar that is going to be with Ron Fisher from Cama Plan. Really great people. This is going to apply to anybody, whether you're a real estate investor currently or not. You should definitely come um, to that. A lot of people are wondering how do some business people um, escape maybe paying taxes or take advantage of the tax system in an ethical and legal way. This is definitely one way to learn how to do that. September 22nd at 11 a.m. Wednesday. And today's webinar is going to be a lot about communication and marketing. Our webinar on September 30th is also going to be about that. We kind of have a theme going for this month. So Definitely come to that one. It's going to be with the CEO of Reifax. We use Reifax down here to help uh, do so many things in real estate investing. It's a great software. Um, you can definitely learn more about how to use that tool and learn how to follow up with your, your lead base, with your clientele. So definitely come to that. And we also have our boot camp. I see that there's some members of our boot camp already in uh, this session right now. So awesome. You already know the deal. For some people who are newer or maybe on the fence about our boot camp, we have um, our information session right now. We're going to have our lead mentors, Ryan and Anish, teaching our boot camp. We're teaching all things real estate investing. If you're ready to grow your real estate investing business, definitely check us out at the boot camp. We have special guests, um, Jose Ramirez. We've had him on our last webinar or two, two webinars ago. We've had him. Uh, Francisco Mago of Reifax, the person I just talked about is also going to be there um, talking about Reifax. They're going to be talking about taxes. We also have um, experts in title and contracting going to be there. So if you need information and uh, learning on how to scale and grow your real estate investing, your wholesaling business, definitely come check us out at the boot camp. It's going to be a really, really great opportunity for you to learn all about that. We also have our mentor program here. So I know that some people have already made their appointments for mentorship. Alexa, if you don't mind putting up those polls to see if anybody may be interested in our mentor program, we can definitely get in touch back with you. Um, you don't have to know right now. You can always give us a call, give us an email. Alexa just put her information in the chat. Um, if you are going through this and it's great information, but you need a little bit more, you maybe want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of our mentors, you can definitely sign up right here or uh, give us a call at that uh, contact that Alexa just put in the chat. And let's see. We have a uh, member benefits with Bria with the National Real Estate Investors Association. I know a lot of you guys are um, probably all, already members. Um, your membership is definitely going to come in handy in 2022 when we start doing our in-person presentations again. That'll be really exciting. So stay tuned for that. We'll be talking more about the membership and our benefits um, in October. And we just wanted to say a quick thank you to our sponsors before we get started. We wouldn't be here without you guys. And REI Black Book is definitely somebody that we work with often. So all of our mentor students use REI Black Book. It is such a useful and handy tool if you're a real estate investor. And I know some of you guys already have REI Black Book. So hopefully you'll get a little bit more information on how to take advantage of that service in today's presentation. So 
Without further ado, I would like to introduce you again to Kevin Carroll. He uh, is going to take over. So let me just stop sharing my screen. And just a couple housekeeping rules before we get started. I'm going to be letting everybody know to put their questions in the Q&A section. Um, we're going to be putting some helpful links and such in the chat section. So definitely take a look at the chat, everyone. But please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A section. Kevin is going to be, you know, giving us a lot of great information today and just telling us what's going on in the texting world. So put those questions in the Q&A. We're going to dive into all of your questions and then just take advantage of the chat. We will be having a giveaway today. Um, as you see here, you can text the word LAW, L-A-W, to our number 954-737-3239 for a chance to win 60 days of REI Black Books program plus their online marketing bundle. $3,482 value. There is going to be one lucky winner. Um, we're, like I said, we're putting all this good stuff in the chat. So just take advantage, check out the chat, but also please put your, Q, um, your questions in the Q&A section. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Am I good to share? Yes. Go right. All right. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this this topic always gets plenty of questions. There's so much changing um, here lately that uh, it's it's important to uh, know what is going on and what we need to do going forward. All right. Can you see my screen? OK, here. Yes. All right. Perfect. All right, so I've titled this Blood in the Water, um, and I wanted to make sure I had the shark here just based on getting to speak to a big group of people in South Florida. But uh, in reality, there is blood in the water. Um, some of us who have been around, I know the question popped into the chat earlier of, are you new? Have you been doing this for a while? Um, somebody made the joke, no, I'm not new. But if you've been doing this for any stretch of time, chances are you probably have heard at least one horror story from another investor or somebody that's in our circle that has either been fined, sued, or having issues surrounding text messaging, cold calling, and ringless voicemails uh, based on some of the new regulation changes. So there's been a lot of confusion, um, a lot of misinformation. Imagine that out in our world. But I just want to kind of clear the air, get everything out there for what the background is, where we're at today, what's coming next, and then more importantly, what do we need to do as investors and as business owners to protect ourselves and our companies going forward and still get leads in a legal manner. All right. So uh, again, who am I? I'm the director of sales at RI Black Book. Um, you know, been working with small business owners for well over a decade now. And my focus, my passion, what I nerd out on is the sales and marketing systems. Um, how do we build processes and automate and delegate a lot of those activities that most of us don't like to do anyway, and then we get consistent results on the backside. So again, um, I was saying before we hopped on here that uh, when I was in the corporate world, I got to come down to Miami all the time. Our corporate office was down there. So um, that was cool, but I couldn't get out of the corporate world fast enough. So over the last few years, since I've been with RIA Black Book, I've really gotten to focus on working with investors every day. Some of them are brand new, just get started. Some of them have big teams and acquisitions and dispo side and, and, you know, basically helping implement systems and tools to solve their problems and, and bring consistency to their business. All right. Before I get too far down the path here, um, I want to point out that I am not an attorney, not an attorney. Um, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm simply providing general information about the TCPA, um, how to stay compliant, what those guidelines are. And if you have any specific legal questions, I highly encourage you to reach out to a local attorney in your state that, that's very familiar with the local rules, regulations, and legislation that you need to abide by. All right, so, so today's agenda. How do we get here? Again, what's the rules? What's changing and, and why is it changing? How do we maintain compliance? And going forward, what do we do, right? We, we still need leads. We still need to, to you know, have our marketing aspects of our companies. What do we need to do? All right. So I like to throw some big numbers out there, especially to get your attention. Next year, 2.7 trillion text messages 
are going to be sent by businesses. So this isn't personal text messages, commercial text messages, business use text messages are going to be 2.7 trillion messages. Absolutely massive amount of messages um, if you look, to, look at this across the country. And why is it so popular? So as we look at texting, oh, here's some stats for you. When we send a text message as a business, as a marketer, 98% of the time, our text messages are getting opened. In real estate investing and most other businesses, period, there's not very many marketing strategies that we can do that is going to have a 98% land rate on a message that we got. Email is not even close, cold calling, all those other things. Uh, there's a reason why text messaging has been so popular. Of those 98% that are opened, I'm sorry, 90% of all those messages are open within the first three minutes. So not only are they opening them, but right away, our intended message is hitting the target 90% of the time within three minutes. And overall response rate, you know, we always look at direct mail as, you know, maybe a, a two or 3% response rate. Um, you know, we can kind of look and see what type of leads come through different marketing strategies and, and, and we can kind of manage our, our volumes based on that. But with text messaging, 45% of all messages sent get a response. That's unheard of. So again, it's easy to see why it's so popular. It's extremely inexpensive. Uh, the, the messages get opened. Uh, they get opened immediately. And almost half the time, it does initiate a response. All right. But for how long? How long is this really going to be? So as we look at the consumers in the world today, 63% say that they expect that they would have to opt in or basically give permission in order for, for businesses to send them messages. They don't want the cold messaging. They want to be opted in first, 63% of people. 92% said that the communications that they are receiving is often or sometimes not even useful. So over nine times out of 10, when we get a text message, usually it's just spam. It's not useful. It's not something we want. So it's, it's just a burden. And then 93% about the, you know, same, about the same percentage there wants to limit how frequently they get messages. How often do they get spammed? All right. So, you know, again, this is uh, nothing new. I'm sure everybody on this call, if we have a cell phone, um, have probably received some sort of a spam text message and the tides are turning. People are kind of getting tired of it here. All right, I want to give you an idea of, of the pool that we're really playing in here. So when we look at do not call list, so the DNC, that's do not call. If we look at the total complaints that are, have been filed with the do not call registry, it's just under 4 million complaints. So um, you can see there's a little graph there um, over the last few years, number of complaints per year, um, and it coincides with what year. So you'll see in 2020, it actually dropped down um, in early 2020. So obviously we had a pandemic going on. A lot of the government agencies that recorded and filed those complaints actually shut down. So you'll see the big dip down uh, here recently, but it, it came back up as soon as the offices reopened. But the, the big takeaway on this, and, and uh, this is really, really important as we kind of understand how do we do this going forward. So Active do not call registrants. So, you know, every, some of us on this call are probably have registered our personal numbers and said, I do not want to be called. Do not call me. I am on the do not call list. There's 241 million active registrants on the do not call list. So think about that. 241 million people have went through the effort of putting themselves on a list saying, do not call me. Well, the census just happened in 2020. There's only 330 million people in the country, which also includes children. So when you look at 330 million people, we have 241 registered do not call list. We've got roughly 90 million people that includes kids that we would legally be able to cold call and text if we don't have their prior uh, written uh, consent, prior, prior permission, if you will. And we'll talk more about that later, but but there's really only 90 million people that aren't registered that we could legally cold call and send text messages to without having prior consent for marketing purposes. All right. So uh, just to give you a quick idea, here's a, some basically the top states as far as number of complaints. Um, the top five categories, you'll see they're imposters. And, you know, I always get the car warranty stuff on vehicles I don't even own anymore, but, you know, computers and everything else. The last year we had, there was a lot of political stuff. Um, and I've got a story about that as well. But as you can see, and then on the right, the complaints by call type. 
So whether it's a live person calling, but what really, really irks people the most, and, and which is what's somewhat uh, being addressed in this recent uh, legislation changes, is are the robocalls. These are those pre-recorded messages. Um, you know, it sounds like a robot most of the time on the other end. Call, you know, I'm the IRS. Call me and give me your credit card number and social security number if you don't want to go to jail, that kind of stuff, right? But those are robocalls, and that's, that's really in the crosshairs as we go forward. All right, just to give you an idea of how many lawsuits, how much litigation has taken place specific to TCPA. And um, the TCPA is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, but it's, uh, and I'll go through that a little bit more, but as you can see, it came through over the last, you know, 20 years. It really spiked in 2009. Um, there was some additional legislation passed then that made it easier to file complaints. But as you can see, that number just came up. Um, we don't have the data from the last couple of years yet, but I expect that to, to be much higher. Um, and and, and you'll, you'll see why later. All right. So uh, this here is just a, a little screenshot. Um, so we talk about all the litigation um, and, you know, everybody here is probably aware of like the fines and, and some of the stuff and I'll cover that. But what's really changed the last couple of years is, so the, the laws have been in place for a long time, but now we have technology in place, the phone carriers and, and the, the um, providers have technology in place that now they can say who sent what messages, all that stuff's tracked. It's harder to spoof numbers and hide who you are and so on and so forth. Well, now the carriers themselves are being held responsible. So if somebody signs up for REI Blackbook, for example, we have a text blast platform and ringless voicemail platform and all that. If we allowed somebody to come in and use our platform and just spammed you know, a million people at once, well, we have skin in the game for them, basically giving them the tools to break the rules. So this here was a, a, a large multi-million dollar lawsuit that happened with one of the carriers. And um, so now they're highly incentivized to help control the process, the individual businesses themselves. We've got a perfect storm here that's kind of coming through. All right. So uh, those of you who have been around long enough, I do remember 1991 uh, to age myself a little bit, but that's really when all the TCPA and regulations changed, uh, started coming into place as far as what are the rules that we have to abide by. So back in 1991, a lot of good stuff was happening. It looks like this was a pretty good year if you're a movie uh, watcher, but all right. Uh, this is what it looked like in 91 as well. So for those of you who don't know, those are actually cell phones um, that the, the, they used to come in a huge leather doctor bag type looking thing. It, it weighed as much as the brick. Um, you know, it was basically like a, a second purse if you had to carry that thing around, but that's what a, a cell phone looked like. All right. So back in 91, um, again, that is when the TCPA originally got started. This here is Senator Fritz Hollins. Um, and this is a quote that he had used during one of the Senate hearings, but calls are the score to modern civilization. They wake us up in the morning. They interrupt our dare at night. They force the sick and elderly out of bed. They hound us until we want to rip the telephone right out of the wall. These calls are a nuisance and an invasion of our privacy. So, I mean, that's pretty strong language. And back then, you know, most people didn't have cell phones. It was landlines. So, you know, so put this in context a little bit. Um, you know, back then to right now, 3% had a cell phone back in 91, 95% have cell phones today. And I'm trying to figure out who that 5% is that don't, <laughs> but, um, you know, 90% back then only had landlines. That was their only <clears throat> means of phone calls, communication today, not even half the population has landlines. Um, and, you know, again, there was no text messages back in 1991, I just showed you just businesses alone is gonna, are going to send 2.7 trillion messages just in 2022. So a completely different landscape, which is why we have new regulations and new systems in place to manage what we're doing. All right, a little bit more info. So back then, businesses actually used to use fax machines to, to for marketing purposes. So instead of sending a text message to somebody, we might send them an unsolicited fax um, you know, cell phones were extremely expensive early on. It didn't matter if they called you or you called them, 
you got billed for every minute that you were on the phone. Um, most plans only had a couple hundred minutes and it was very expensive, uh, to, you know, for, un, you know, when unlimited talking came out, that was huge because traditionally you kind of paid per minute, you know, auto dialers, you know, all these like mojo type systems and call tools and, and so on. Um, you know, those are all new, but back then there were automated dialing systems back in 1991 that would basically say, Hey, if you're in the seven, eight, six or three Oh three area code, um, you know, I just want to call every single number on there. And it would just literally call every single number inside of an, uh, of a area code until they, they got somebody on the phone there. So that technology was new. The number of calls was skyrocketing. It was interrupting dinner time and, and all that stuff that Senator Fritz Hollins was talking about. So that's what really led to all of this. So, um, you know, if I had a cell phone back in 91 and I had marketers calling me on it, as expensive as it was per minute, I'd be pretty upset if I got billed to talk to a spam call, right? Um, if I was paying for the expensive fax machine paper, I don't want people faxing me unless I, they, I have their permission. So that's kind of the world that we lived in back then and what led to some of these changes. All right, so again, the automated dialers back then was new. It made it really easy for people to just call and call and call everybody. Um, well, the challenge is inside of an area code, there's hospitals, there's police departments, there's fire stations. Um, there's a lot of people that are getting, you know, phone calls when they shouldn't have. It was tying up emergency lines and so on and so forth. That was a problem. Invasion of privacy. You know, that the phone ringing and interrupting dinner. It was a very personal thing as, as what I showed you in that quote. <clears throat> and then the cost, right? I just told you cell phones and faxes extremely expensive. So those were the main things that they wanted to address. So the government got together and regulators going to regulate is like I, how I like to say it. But <clears throat> what do they do? So they say, all right, here's who you can call, text, or fax. Here's how you can do it. Here's what you can do when you do it. And here's when you can do it. So again, they're going to pretty much control every aspect of that. And that's what that step was doing. So again, just to kind of keep this in place, 1991, it prohibited unsolicited automated calls. You couldn't just call every single number sequentially um, on a you know automated system and just run through it. It put in hours, right? So before 8 a.m. and after 9 p.m., you can't call somebody for, for marketing purposes. <clears throat> if you do and you get caught, it was a $1,500 per violation fine. That didn't really do a whole lot of good, frankly. Um, back then, the technology wasn't there to track it, to stop it, to, to find out who was breaking the rules and who wasn't. There really wasn't any way to go about it. But if somehow they found a way to get you, the laws were in place. So fast forward to 2003. Now we came out with the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Act. All right. What that, the big thing with that is it created the Do Not Call Registry. So it wasn't until 2003 that we could, as consumers, register our own numbers, our own names, saying, do not call me. I don't want to be sold anything. All right. It implemented the FTC had specific rules for telemarketing that they put in place. And we'll talk about that. And uh, so, again, 2003, yep, you could register, do not call. But again, the technology, the infrastructure to track who was making the calls, um, were they doing it correctly and then tracking them down if they weren't, it, it didn't exist. So, you know, the, 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 the paper was there so with the rules. There was just no way possible to truly track it, monitor it and, and police what those rules were. All right. So in 2009, there was a little bit more that came through. It's the Truth and Caller ID Act. Um, in effect, it's basically spoofing numbers, um, hiding who you are and things like that. Again, infrastructure wasn't there, didn't really have any teeth. But to show you how little the 1991 rules, the 2003 rules, and the 2009 rules had, <clears throat> if you look at what happened just in 2020, it was roughly 46 billion robocalls happened just in 2020. And that was actually down from 2019. So with the pandemic and everything else, it, it actually decreased the number of robocalls slightly, but there was 58 and a half billion in 2019. So in one year, that's how many robocalls happen. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. All right. So that's why we are talking about the new changes going forward. So 
Last year in 2020, um, Trump signed into effect what is called the TRACED Act. It's the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence Act, the TRACED Act. What that does, so it increased the statute of limitations. Back in 1991, if you may, had a violation, if you, uh, you know, broke the rules, they had one year to come back and basically hold you accountable for, for sending or making that phone call. Now, after last year's legislation, they have four years. So if I send a text message or a pre-recorded message or call somebody that I shouldn't today, they have four years to hold me accountable for it. So complete game changer there, complete game changer. Not only do they have longer to hold us accountable, but the infrastructure is now in place that they're going to know who sent the message, what number it belonged to, um, and they're going to be able to find us much more easily and take action to hold us accountable. All right. So they can do it for longer. It's going to be easier to find us. And they're going to ding us with bigger fines, bigger lawsuits. The, the financial penalties have been increased. So it went from $1,500 up to $10,000 per violation, up to $10,000 per violation now. And again, it's implementing the business registration and tracking so they know who sent what, who did it, when they did it, who they sent it to, all that's in place. And indemnification for carriers. Like I said earlier, carriers now have some skin in the game. Um, they have to basically help police and manage this. And ultimately, they're making it easier for consumers to make complaints, report bad actors. So when I showed you the number of complaints earlier that it kind of came down a little bit in 2020. Um, now that new rules is making it easier, we're going to see a dramatic increase when that data is released um, for next year. All right. So I'm not going to run through this entire list here. Um, I just really want to kind of hit some of the highlights. But I mentioned earlier, um, you know, some of the original rules that were in place and some of the new stuff that came through. But Back in 91, you know, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So those of you who have REI Black Book, you know that our automated text system and, and, and ringless voice system and everything else, if it falls outside of the hours of 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., we don't send those automated messages out because we are TCPA compliant. We're not going to allow you to break the rules and possibly get yourself in trouble as well as, um, you know, put us in a spot as the provider. So 8 to 9 p.m., there it is. You have to also maintain your own internal do not call list. So you as a business owner has to, so if I call somebody today, if I call Alexa and I'm trying to you know, see if she wants to sell the property, she says, take me off your list. Do not call me again. I need to maintain Alexa's name, phone number, the date that she told me to take her off the list. And I have to maintain that for five years. If, if there's a lawsuit or something that comes down the road, I have to be able to provide every person that's opted out over the last five years in my business, whether or not they're on the do not call list. So that's an important part of this. All right. Um, you know, there's some other things here, you know, who you're calling it, uh, if, is it a fax, so on and so forth. But um, one of the things is, you know, in the subscriber may sue for up to three times the damages, um, which is 1500 for each violation from a lawsuit standpoint. Um, that doesn't even count the fines and so on and so forth that I'll, that I'll get into here in a minute. All right. Um, let's see. All right. So just to give you some more e details on the do not call registry. So most of you probably have heard this used here recently, but for those of you who don't, it's basically a national registry that, um, that consumers can log in, put their name, their phone number and say, I don't want to get calls. Well, as marketers, as business owners, if we're cold calling, texting and everything else, we need to register ourselves with the do not call registry as well. So that's something that a lot of people don't know. So they know that we have to scrub list and, and so on and so forth. But we as marketers should have a, an account set up with the do not call the DNC registry as marketers. And we're sellers. There's three functions. It's sellers, we're telemarketers or service providers, or we're exempt. Just so you know, if you're a real estate investor, you fall into the seller bucket here. Um, we're, we're not service providers. We're not exempt. We have to follow the rules as a seller. But we are providing goods and services to a customer. Um, that services is buying and selling properties, so on and so forth. But you'll see at the bottom of the screen, I highlighted it. 
the seller has to subscribe to area codes. There's fees associated with, with registering with the do not call. Um, there's certain requirements in order to basically get approved. After we register our businesses, they assign us what they call a subscription account number. A SAN number is what they call it. And that is from straight from the National Do Not Call Registry. After we have that SAN number, we have to basically register that, um, our numbers and so on and so forth. I've got some more information on that, but every seller, every business must have its own subscription to the DNC registry and they have to have their own SAN number um, separate from the telemarketers and everything else. So, you know, each one of these different buckets, if you're a seller and a telemarketer, if you've got multiple different groups that your business falls in, you have to play and register each one. But um, investors, we are sellers. Um, you do have to have a SAN number and go through that. So just to, just to make sure that you're clear on the do not call registry, there is an annual subscription by the area code. So if you're in the 303 or, you know, uh, 786, whatever it is, Basically, there is a subscription that is per area code that you have to pay. We need to synchronize our list every 30 days. So if we're marketing and Alexa says, takes, takes me off your list, um, I'm continuing to call. Every 30 days, we need to go through and make sure that, hey, are there new people on this list that recently registered for the do not call list, um, new ones and so on. We can't just pull a list today and expect that data to be valid for the next year. So you have to keep up with it every month. And just so you know, um, starting October of last year, uh, we can get data for five zip codes for free. After you register, um, you know, whatever area codes that you typically market and do business in, you can get five area codes worth of data from the DNC absolutely free. If you need more than five area codes, if you're a national investor and you market all over the place, there is a fee, um, you know, sixty-six dollars per additional area code, and you'll see the maximum there. So, all right, and just one more thing, uh, you know, after we provided the required information and we're certified and registered and all that, we pay the fees. Um, our, our smaller investors, we can actually hop in and basically check numbers uh, up to ten at a time or less. Like, and they've got like an on-demand page that you can check that. So you get up to 10 numbers for free. Um, so if you're really small and not doing a whole lot of business and a whole lot of marketing, there's ways to avoid the fines uh, altogether there. But anywho, we, we'll go through that more later. All right, so the first question we always get here and we can stop and ask a couple of questions here if, if you'd like, but um, the one that always pops up right now is, when do I need to register for my subscription account number? And you'll see the answer here is, you should have already done it. It was yesterday, it was a couple months ago. You should already have your subscription account number if you are cold calling, texting, and marketing um, your business, you need to be registered with the Do Not Call Registry. All right, um, I can stop here. Is there any questions for the time being? Um, Alexa, yes, there are. There are some the... questions, yes, definitely. Right. So I have people uh, answering this poll first, um, how many of you use texting and cold calling for marketing? So let's get to know you guys a little bit better. So a lot of people, it's it's about 50-50. Some people are saying they do, some people are saying they don't. Uh, yeah, okay. about 20 people replied so far and it's 50-50 down the middle. 50, so 50, that's, 50, a, that's middle. Good, to right. good to know. Yeah, okay. definitely. Good deal. And maybe put in the chat, if maybe you're not doing, I probably should have added one more a selection. If you're not doing it now, but you plan to, let us know if you plan to uh, do cold calling or text marketing, if you're not already. Yep. So and we 50, do have some questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Historically when we yeah. ask that question, it's usually about 75%. And, you know, again, it's easy to know why. When I shared the numbers up front, it's very inexpensive, high deliverability, high open rate, high response rates, you know, all that stuff usually leads to a bunch of people doing it. Um, so uh, having 50%, you guys are teaching them to generate inbound leads very well down there. I like it. Yeah. And we do have some people who are newer too. So they're just starting out on their, their journeys. So that's yep. uh, probably, you should take that into account. Alrighty, so Mia's asking, if you're pulling lists, are you supposed to cross-reference it to the do not uh, do not call list? Great question, and yes. 
So if you're pulling a list, um, some, some of those list providers too, by the way, they can scrub those lists before they give them to you. But if you're pulling a list, you should 100% check that against the do not call registry before you send a text um, or even cold call them or anything. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Lucian yeah. asks, are sellers and marketers ever audited by the FCC for compliance? Historically, um, there's not a whole lot until there's, you know, you don't usually have a problem until there's a problem, right? So if you get a bunch of complaints, you've got lawsuits filed against you and so on and so forth, um, then, then that's when you're probably going to be a little bit more exposed. But the, the people that have to really worry about it, I shared that that multi-million dollar lawsuit earlier with Globex. It's right now the carriers themselves are getting a lot of scrutiny from the FTC as far as what they're doing, um, how they're policing it and managing it. The smaller actors right now, um, I haven't personally heard a whole lot of issues from, from audits yet, but um, we have heard there's a lot of lawsuits and fines and stuff like that that we are hearing, but, but not audits, no. Gotcha. All right. Thanks so much. I, that's all the questions for all right, now. Perfect. I'll keep going. Oh, here. We got one more that came oh, in all right. based off of what you just said. What's the best way to audit our lists? So uh, is that would be, you need to register your business with the do not call registry. And I've got a guide that I'm going to give everybody at the end of this call that shows you where to go to do it, how to do it. Um, it's a step-by-step -step guide, what you need to do going forward to stay compliant. But um, ultimately, to answer your question, you would need to register your business with the Do Not Call Registry, um, subscribe to those area codes, and then you can basically check those numbers yourself or have somebody scrub that list for you. But um, that, that would be the process you need, you need to follow. Okay, so some more questions are just coming in. Um, someone asked, can you still be fined if you register the SAN and call using that number? And what's um, the benefit? Yeah, so so the fines and 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 lawsuits will come into play. Um, just because you register doesn't mean that you do it correctly, right? So you can register and have a bunch of people on the do not call list. If you continue to call and text them, even though they're on that list, then yes, regardless of whether you're registered or not, you can still be held accountable for those actions. Yes. Okay. And last one for now, how does this apply to an investor who is trying to track down the owner of a property and is calling someone who is not the owner? In this case, the investor is trying to locate someone and not buy or sell on this particular so, call. They're yeah, just trying yeah, to yeah. find so, the person. So mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter if on that one phone call, if, if, the, if at any, the only reason you're making that call is because you're expecting a future opportunity to provide goods or services. It doesn't matter if you're calling a next of kin right now, trying to find out who it is. The purpose of that call is ultimately to provide goods and services. So the rules would still apply to you. Um, you know, before you call somebody, you got to make sure they're not on the do not call list. It doesn't matter if you're just trying to find out contact info for somebody else or whatever, those rules still would apply to you on that. Yes. That yeah, makes sense. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, people are saying good information. So let's keep on going, right. uh, folks. Thank you so much for putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, they get lost in the chat. So if you have any other questions, just go ahead and type in the Q&A um, for next week. All right. Let me see here. Oh, am I going the wrong way? I am. All right. Sorry. I think I've got a little delay here. Okay. All right. So what happens to companies that don't pay for the registry? So this was kind of one of the questions a little bit here, but a company that is a seller or telemarketer could be liable for placing any telemarketing calls. It doesn't even matter if that number is registered or not. So that was that question, right? Even if that, if, if our, our lead or our contact is on the do not call list or not, if we're not registered ourselves as a business, as a seller and telemarketer, we can be fined up to $43,000 per violation. Now, I personally have not heard anybody, any investors that have, have been hit with this, or, but the rule is in place. And now that the infrastructure and tracking is in place for them to come back and, and basically hold us accountable, I would be really, really careful with this because the way the rule is written, if I'm a marketer, I'm an investor, I'm a business owner, I haven't registered with the do not call list and I'm making outbound calls and text messages, um, I need to be registered because by not doing so, I'm violating the rules and that fine is a big one. Again, I have not heard 
any investors that have had that issue, but this is the way the rules are written. Um, don't put yourself on a spot. I don't know a whole lot of people that can take one or two of these violations and move on without uh, really being in trouble here, right? So, all right. <clears throat> this here's another one, right? This was kind of asked a second ago, but I, this comes up every single time and, and I get why, but I'm not buying, I'm selling, right? Or I'm not selling, I'm buying. That doesn't matter. It's all about the goods and services. Um, you know, it's ultimately, <clears throat> you're not doing it just be, you know, if you're a nonprofit, that you have a different set of rules. But if you're, if you are a for-profit business or you're doing anything for goods and services, exchange of money down the road, <clears throat> that doesn't fly. So <clears throat> again, I'm not selling, I'm not selling anything. I'm buying houses. That doesn't work. Um, you're the only reason you're buying that house is because of a financial transaction, there's a benefit for you, uh, some type of payment down the road. So that will not fly. Don't try to use it. All right. <clears throat> if a call is motivated in part to achieve a future sale is like kind of what I just said, then that is the talk point. You're not going to be able to argue your way out of that one. All right. So another common question, what if like FISBOs, you know, for sale by owners or people who have something advertise on Facebook or Craigslist or, you know, whatever the case is. Um, this has been decided if they are advertising their phone number. So if I'm a FISBO owner and I'm registered on the do not call list, but I have my property and my phone number advertised because I'm selling my house, you can call me even if I'm on the do not call list. I'm now actively marketing myself, my house for, for, for sale. Um, you can call them. You don't have to worry about scrubbing a do not call list for somebody who is on the FSBO or has their property advertised anywhere. So I just wanted to point that out there. Um, it comes up all the time. All right. The no uh, next part of this, and I'll kind of go through a little bit more of what the specific new changes are that were implemented in 2020, but our ringless voicemail is now illegal. Those of you who've been around, you've probably heard some chatter pre-recorded messages, ringless voicemails. They're illegal. They're dead. They're not illegal. They're not illegal. Um, you can still legally send pre-recorded messages and ringless voicemails. The kicker now is that we have to have written prior express consent. So not just have they opted into a, you know, a texted into us or something like that, but we, they either have to have Written, uh, blah, blah. we have to have written permission before we can send an automated pre recorded message or ringless voicemail. So, um, you know, them telling us verbally on the phone, yes, you can send me messages, that's not good enough. Um, <clears throat> them, you know, answering a, a billboard or something when they call in, that's not good enough. They have to, you know, if they go through a website and that, that disclaimer is on, on the web form at the bottom, yes, that's written percent uh, uh, consent. If we send them an email and, you know, hey, do I have your permission to follow up, including text messages and pre-recorded messages? Yes, there you go. But the, the, the rules on this, and that's those robocalls that, you know, 55 billion calls that happened in 2019, those pre-recorded messages, those are in the crosshairs. Um, the, actually, they just proposed the largest fine in our history about a month ago, a few weeks ago, and it was all politically motivated ads that were running up in Wisconsin. Uh, maybe it was Michigan. It was either Wisconsin or Michigan. I, I don't remember now, but a political group up there sent out 1,143 pre-recorded messages that uh, they didn't have written permission for. And uh, they just got hit with $4,500 per violation. It was a multi-million dollar uh, uh, fine uh, violation that just happened a couple weeks ago. And again, they've got the infrastructure and tracking in place now to find out who sent the messages, who the carrier was and all that, who it was sent to. So uh, we're gonna see more of those, but be very careful with ringless voicemails. You have to have written prior consent. All right, how do you obtain it? Again, they can send a keyword to a short code or a phone number. I'll let you guys text in here in a little bit to, to download that guide. Um, by texting in, you'll see my little disclaimer on there, but enter a phone number on a web form, right? So if I go to, uh, you go to my website and say, I want an offer on my property, they check the box acknowledging that that's written permission, or they can come in and sign up at a physical location, but that's the three ways uh, for that. All right. So again, the TCPA, it restricts making phone calls or residential lines using artificial or pre-recorded voice technology, except for non-commercial purposes. Well, that's not us. 
for non-telemarketing commercial, that's not us either. Um, and then by tax exempt nonprofits, that's not us either. So again, we have to follow the rules. All right. I mentioned earlier that uh, the, the TSR, the telemarketing sale rules, this was part of 2009's legislation changes. But a couple of things that I wanted to kind of point out because uh, I have heard one person get hit with this, but you'll see down here at the bottom, telemarketers are required to connect their call to a sales rep within two seconds of the consumer's greeting. So for those of you who are using automated dialers, those systems, they go through and they're dialing a bunch of people. And then when somebody picks up, it then waits and sends it to you to pick up the call. If somebody picks that up and it takes more than two seconds to get back to them, um, that is technically a violation and you can get in trouble. So make sure you just be super duper careful that when you're using those automated dialers, that uh, you're not, that they're not waiting for five seconds or 10 seconds. You know, when we get robo calls and live calls, you know, we've all had that little delay before somebody pipes in from a call center or whatever. Um, there is a two second rule on that. And uh, I, there, there's some, some changes with that. So, all right. So uh, again, if you're not familiar with what a dialer is, an automated dialer, um, it's basically a system that will go through and I can punch in a bunch of numbers. Here's a, here's a list and it's gonna just, you know, go down the list and call all 500 of these numbers, one after another, after another, as soon as one connects, it connects it with me. Um, those are really in the, in the kind of crosshairs here. We don't want, uh, th those are the bad actors. You know, somebody can just pull a massive list. They don't scrub it against the do not call registry. And then they just start calling and calling and calling or sending text blasts and pre-recorded messages and things like that. So you just have to be super careful with automated dialers. All right. Out off the press. So uh, before, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, the, the, the court systems themselves went back and forth on what's a dialer, what's not a dialer. Up until earlier this year, technically, ARIA Blackbook could have been seen as a dialer because we have a CRM that manages contacts. We also have a phone system attached to it. Even though they couldn't press a button and just you know, automatically call everybody, the way they had it written, say, hey, if it maintains contacts and has any potential to dial out, that's a dialer. Well, now they came back and said, nope, it actually has to be able to you know, call them all in a row. It makes sense. So good news is, Aria Black Book's not illegal. Cool. All right. So stay compliant. Again, do not use an auto dialer if you don't have re required consent for marketing uh, or non marketing calls. Don't use pre recorded um, or artificial voice messages unless you have prior express consent of all of the people receiving those messages. Written consent. Enable processes for our contacts to opt out. If they say, take me off your list. How do you maintain that list? How do you make sure that they don't get called again? Um, if you're using text messaging, make sure that they can reply back, stop or delete or, you know, all those normal industry things that will opt them out automatically. Um, maintain your list, scrub your marketing list against the do not call list, uh, national and state, by the way, and make sure that you're not calling at 10 o'clock at night and six o'clock in the morning, all that stuff. So again, don't mislead people, but here are the, the main reasons and main ways to stay compliant. All right, so uh, I'll point this out just a little bit. There's, there are differences in landlines versus cell phones. So as we're calling and marketing our businesses to, to our leads on the landline, you know, an automated dialogue system, basically we just gotta make sure that they're not registered on the do not call list. Um, if, if, if we're calling a landline. If we're calling a cell phone, well, hey, if we're gonna use the dialer, you have to have written consent beforehand that uh, they're opted in and uh, pre-recorded voice messages. Again, must have prior written consent. If we're going to have a ringless voicemail drop on a landline voice, uh, answering machine or a cell phone voicemail, we have to have written permission. Manually dialed. So do we actually dial it ourselves? Do we physically push the buttons or you know, click to call that one person versus being automated? We just have to check the do not call list and then faxes. I, I, that's still on there, but anyway. So um, that just kind of shows you what permission levels you need, whether it's a landline or a cell phone. All right, the TRACE Act, that was what Trump signed last year in 2020. That is the new teeth behind the rule. So again, it increases the fines to $10,000 per call, per call. So if, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share a quick story here. There's a gentleman that's a part of our uh, mastermind that we're in. And uh, 
big time investor, national investor does 15 to 20 deals every month, but um, he just got out of an 18 month lawsuit for sending two text messages and one cold call to somebody who was on the do not call list. So he had three violations and uh, this started 18 months ago. He tried to sell out of court, sell out of court. They, they refused, took it all the way through. The judge did rule against him and he had to pay it. It was, it was only like $8,500 judgment against him or 7,500 actually, I think, I'm sorry. But so in addition to paying that 7,500 bucks, he had 18 months worth of hassle, frustration and legal expenses for his, you know, for his attorney to fight it and everything else um, over three violations. So this stuff does happen. And we just, I just learned about this about a month and a half ago, but we're hearing this more and more and more. Uh, you know, we've got thousands of members across the country that use REI Black Book. Um, when we did our first webinar on this topic, you know, all of a sudden we started hearing from all these people, like, hey, I, yep, I just got hit. I just got hit. And, um, you know, people don't talk about it enough, but it's happening more and more frequently. But again, down there at the bottom, the takeaway, the same rules apply. You're, you know, got to make sure you're scrubbing the list, um, not using dialers, this and this and this. But now they have four years statute of limitations to hold us accountable when we do stuff that we shouldn't be doing today. All right. The next part of the legislation of, of the Trace Act last year. So, yep, hey, we're clear on the violations. We know we have to scrub lists and, and you know, how to basically follow the rules. But how are they going to track us? This is a major, major piece that, that really is making all of this possible from a fine and violation and lawsuit standpoint. So what that legislation did last year, in effect, uh, they call it stir and shaken. But what the carriers are now doing is now you have to register your businesses and so on. So if I use Verizon or I use Twilio or whatever for, for my carrier that I'm using for my texting and my phone calls and so on, the end carrier, so maybe I'm calling Alexa who has AT&T. So my carrier has skin in the game and AT&T has skin in the game to protect Alexa. So what this is all doing is basically creating the infrastructure and technology to where my carrier is going to basically check me. Do, am I registered with the do not call list? Did I register my phone numbers? Can Basically, can they verify who is sending that marketing message? Like, have, do they know who I am? Did they provide the number to me? Did I register to tell them what I was doing, how I was doing it, so on and so forth? All right. Same thing on the other side. When I go to send that message out, well, AT&T now has to have a system to vet. All right. Hey, do, can I verify who is sending this message to my customer? Did, you know, did, did the other carrier already do this and so on and so forth? So now they're going to block those messages. They have skin in the game. So they're actually going to start filtering those messages from even being delivered. So if I haven't registered my number, um, Alexa hasn't opted into me. We don't have like a, a prior um, business relationship or anything like that. Well, my carrier may block it from going out. And if not, Alexa's carrier may block it from, from ever receiving her, her number because they don't want to be held responsible when lawsuits are flying around again saying, hey, you let Kevin send all these spam messages out. Now we're going to sue you and fine you since you didn't basically control the process. So now we have technology and infrastructure in place. The carriers do to know, all right, I know who's sending the message. They can verify and trust that and like, they'll block it on the other side. So you might, some of you may have like potential spam stuff popping up and, and you've seen some changes over the last handful of months as far as when we get spam calls, that, that's all part of this, guys. Um, so again, that's a very long-winded way to say it. And what that all means, again, so calling party to the called party, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens in the middle, but they're basically authenticating that it's a good marketer, they're registered, we know who's doing it. Yep, I approve it. Now it goes to, to the receiving party, their carrier. Yep, hey, this is this is cool. We'll let that message get delivered. If it anywhere in there that they can't trust it or something's not jiving, they just block the message. So um, actually, Alexa, there was a second question for the poll as far as those who are doing texting. I'm really curious to know, are you seeing reduced deliverability? So yeah. for those 50% of the audience, um, you know, are you seeing dropping deliverability rates with your text messages? Um, are, are you basically 
is your message yeah. landing to to the, your intended audience? All righty, so that is coming in now. Okay. Uh, let's give it a couple more seconds, okay. and then okay. I'll I'll let you know the results. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. So, you know, again, uh, this is just kind of showing full attestation, partial and gateway. This is basically kind of like a credit score is how I, I explain it. So everybody knows how credit scores work. Um, the banks and, and that whole system, they have a formula and a process to say, how credit worthy are you? You know, have you paid your bills in the past? Um, do you have liens and this and this and this? Are you overextended? So on. Well, this is basically a credit score for telemarketing and, 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 and uh, investors. So what it is, is they're gonna say, okay, yep, yeah, this person, I can verify their identity. I know what type of marketing they're doing. I know what their messages are. And they're gonna basically say, yep, yeah, you're good to go. And they give you a trust score, they call it. And um, that trust score is gonna limit how many messages you can send out. Um, if you have a low trust score, then your messages have a much higher likelihood of getting blocked. Alexa's phone is never even gonna receive your text message if your trust score is low because you're identified as spam. But if you've registered and done everything and have a high trust score, well, you're gonna have much higher deliverability rates and Alexis Carrier is not gonna block your message from getting there because, okay, this guy's a trustworthy person, we know who it is and so on. So in effect, that's what this all is. Um, but uh, what was the results on that poll if we have any here? Yes, alrighty, so 21 people responded. Uh, 14, 15, 22. Okay. So 15 people are saying that they don't send, um, marketing messages. Um, again, we do have a lot of newer investors in okay. our audience. Okay. Um, and so th four of the 20, 23 people, I'm sorry, four of the remaining people who do send messages haven't noticed any, uh, div uh, deliverability rates dropping and okay. three people have noticed rates dropping. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we, our platform, we send out a couple million messages a month. So we have direct visibility as far as, you know, de deliverability rates, how many get blocked by the carriers, what's the reasons behind it. And over the last few months, we've seen a significant drop off for people who haven't registered their numbers and have a SANS number. Um, I actually just had a call with a, a really big investor out of Utah. This is a week and a half ago. And they were historically about 75% deliverability rate for text messaging over the last couple of years. In the last four months, um, and they don't use ARIA Blackbook for their cold text blasting. We actually prefer people not to use us for that side of it based on all of what I'm telling you here today. Um, but their, their deliverability rate is now 11%. So 11 out of every 100 um, is getting delivered. 89% of their messages are getting blocked and not even getting delivered right now. And they haven't registered numbers and went through the process and everything else. So we're helping them do that now. But uh, so those of you who are using texting, you know, if you have visibility, make sure that one, those messages are getting delivered, um, that you're not paying for text messages that aren't hitting the spot. And if you do see lower um, deliverability, that guide that I'll show you later, make sure you get registered before you keep going forward. All right. So again, requirements for every business, you know, you've got to register, you got to, how big's your business, what industry are you in, size, you know, your employer ID numbers, all that stuff. You got to register campaigns. And again, that determines your trust score and uh, basically any fees and, and volume restrictions that you, they're going to place on you. All right. So all right, Black Book, we're actually building this out right now in our system. So we're going to have this set up here in the very near future. We're, we're still waiting. Every carrier has different guidelines and information that they're collecting. So of, of course, there's not just one simple way that's going to appease everybody. We've got to try to, you know, work with all these different carriers and build a system that works for everyone. But uh, we're building this now. You'll be able to register right inside of RI Black Book, how to, you know, put your numbers in there, the DNC information, all that example campaigns and so on. And uh, we'll make this really easy to, to help you register and, and add additional campaigns going forward and, and track all that. So here's that trust score, like I said, based on how high you rank, what the risk is, messages that you can do per day, per second, all that stuff. Again, more trustworthy, you're good to go. Less trustworthy, uh, they're gonna limit how many and what type. All right, so, uh, you know, I'm, I won't get into this, it's kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but um, historically, 
there's always been short codes, you know, text one, two, three, four, five to this, whatever. Um, you can also do texting with toll free numbers. Most people aren't using that. Uh, short codes are very expensive. Toll free numbers uh, just aren't usually good for texting anyway. The 10 digit local numbers, that's really kind of uh, the new and mandatory requirements are verifying the senders and, and the trust score associated with those local numbers that, that we're talking about here. Okay. So again, local identity equals increased engagement. My carrier knows who I am. I'm registered, all that. It verifies on the other side throughout the system and improved deliverability is ultimately that. So if you don't register, your messages are not even going to get delivered if you're sending text and pre-recorded uh, voicemails and things like that. All right. So going forward, um, you know, I, I promise a texting um, guide here. So I'm, I'm kind of having some fun with this down here at the bottom, but by texting, oh, I'm sorry, text legal to 786-751-751. 7926. Just text the word legal. It doesn't have to be capitalized. It, you know, just L-E-G-A-L. -E text the word legal to 786-751-7926. Uh, our system will shoot you back a link. You'll be able to download the exact guide to all the, the rules. A lot of stuff that I changed, and it'll give you step-by-step -step instructions of how to register, what information you need, timing all that good stuff. Um, that way uh, you don't have to try to remember everything that I talked about today. But, and uh, you'll see down here, just like an example message that I had put in here. Hey, you're agreeing to send marketing promotional messages, including texts and calls made using automatic dialing system or pre-recorded. This is a sample type language that you can put on advertising, on websites, uh, web forms and things like that as, as your written permission. All right, so ultimately uh, you need to build like an incoming lead machine. So I told you earlier, there's only 90 million people that are, are not registered on the do not call list uh, across the country. A lot of them are kids. So the pool is a pretty small number as we're you know, sending out these massive text campaigns and so on and so forth. The better way going forward is you're going to need to find a way to generate inbound leads that don't require cold calling necessarily and cold texting. Cold calling is still good. Scrub the list. Make sure they're not on the do not call list. Cold calling can still be very, very effective way to, to build rapport and work with leads. But again, after we register those numbers, there's only 90 million. We're going to have a pretty small pool to play in. So we need to generate inbound leads coming in. Um, one of the, the lucky winner, and uh, I'd be curious to who that is. I'll, I'll, I'll see that. But we've got basically a, a process around how to generate incoming leads. So you've got to target the problem. You know, whatever it is, and this is nothing new for some of you who've been around, but divorce and code violations and so on, any distressed properties. And then what do we do on the backside? So here's the problem. Here's our solutions, you know, close fast, no agents, commissions, all those normal points that we need to kind of drive home with motivated sellers. Um, and then ultimately automate that in the process. So once we target the problem, we have the solution, we can build inbound lead strategies um, and automate that to make sure that we're not relying on these outbound marketing um, for, for cold calling and things like that. So um, we mentioned earlier, somebody's going to be lucky enough to get 60 days via Black Book, and we have a complete online marketing bundle um, that we have sold here with all these TCPA changes. We're trying to show everyone what are some other ways to generate leads versus cold calling and cold texting and so on. So we've got uh, some basically training workshops that focus on bandit signs on wheels, you know, putting stickers on cars and driving around um, with different extensions, um, getting leads that way, inbound leads, probate letters, Google ads, uh, using search engine optimization, running Facebook ads or direct mail, you know, basically having those leads where we're targeting our list and having them call into us versus us calling them. So, um, you know, basically kind of changing that around a little bit here. So again, the lucky winner is going to get all this marketing mastery workshop. It's basically how to build your evergreen growth traffic machine, how to automate it, bandit signs on wheels, search engine optimization, Google ads, um, how to work on probate list, and then Facebook ads. So I just wanted to kind of show uh, who the lucky winner, what they're going to get. These are just some of the ways that you can work on. And I'm sure Anish and Ryan have tons of, of helpful tips, tips and strategies and ways to 
you know, find motivated sellers to generate inbound leads versus cold blasting lists and things like that. Um, I know that you're, you're in good hands on that side of things here. So again, uh, if you need that guide again, that's where you can text in, but uh, I can open it up for any questions at this point here. I went through that pretty quick, assuming that there'd be a lot of questions on the backside. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we do have a winner. We'll let you know at the so end. So we we'll keep winner. it, uh, you know, we'll keep you on your toes. Okay. So we do Great. have a ton of questions. And if they did not win, Kevin, can they still take advantage of right. these opportunities? Kevin, can they still take advantage of these opportunities? Yes. Uh, so I don't have a thing set up right now, but um, anybody who wants that, I will send you a link, Alexa, and I'll make sure that we do something special for your group like we always do, for sure. Perfect. Perfect. We're going to um, put all of that in our thank you email. So soon after the webinar, you'll be getting an email from me and you'll we'll be able to get that link uh, that Kevin is talking about. So great. We're going to get started. We have tons of questions. So this is awesome. We're gonna start off with Ruben and Ruth. They kind of have the same question. So we'll knock okay. out two with one stone here. So they're using Google Voice. And the question basically is when I'm using Google Voice as my business phone to make calls, can I register that uh, Google Voice number as well yes. and use it for te telemarketing? Yes. So even if you have Google Voice, um, if you have all right, a Black Books phone system, if you've you know, no matter how many, even if it's just your personal cell phone, you need to register those numbers that you're using for marketing purposes in your business. So it doesn't matter where you acquire the numbers, you will need to register uh, all of those numbers, but that is a good question. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that works with essentially any um, internet phone number. I know that it's not just Google voice. There's so many other internet phone companies out there. Correct. That yeah, correct. So, I mean, if you've got numbers through like a mojo dialer system or, I mean, any of that, all of those numbers that you're using for marketing must be registered. Perfect. Okay. So, so Mia asked, I work with an investor who sends me a list. I'm not an employee. Does this mean I need to register my business as well, even though he is pulling the list? So <clears throat> if you're working for the same company, and it's basically like, so, so yes, you'll, it, it, one, one more time. Can you repeat that? I just to make sure that yeah. I completely understand. So Mia is working with an investor. She's not, uh, she's, she's not an employee of that company. Uh, okay. She's working for an investor who's pulling the list for her. I guess they have a partnership, but she's not a direct employee. Um, do, does she need to register her business? separate yes. from the investors. Okay. Yep. So if she's doing any of that activity in exchange for goods and services with the expectation of a financial benefit in the back, in the, on the backside, then yes, uh, she'll need to register um, as well. And he should register as well. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Lucian says, do you have, how do you handle companies that spoof their numbers? You are unable to return a call to the number and you can't identify the company. So uh, that whole stir and shaking part that we talked about, first of all, the spoofing of numbers that like, if you do have people that are still doing it, that's going to go away in the very near future. Um, so part of that registering thing, if they, you, obviously, if you're spoofing numbers, you're not going to register your real number. Um, and if you don't do that, your messages probably aren't going to get delivered anyway. So you're going to be paying for a service and not getting the results. But um, if there are providers out there that are still allowing you to spoof numbers, it's going to be a very, very short limited time before that goes away entirely. Um, <clears throat> it's yeah. I mean, there's still some people trying to, trying to cheat it, but ultimately once the, I mean, because right now the infrastructure is in place, but the carriers and everything else, I mean, they're still building this out and putting additional safeguards in each and every week to help block these numbers, you know, manage the process stop the bad actors, track who, who's doing what, and so on and so forth. So in, in two months from now, it's going to be even harder to, to go through here without having your stuff blocked and, and being held accountable. So um, if you are doing that today, you know, again, I encourage you to follow the rules and guidelines, but be prepared because that's probably not going to last very much longer anyway. All righty. Thank you. Okay. Karen says, if I have multiple phone numbers, I 
I use in my business to track where different leads come from. Do mm. I, yeah, I think you already answered that. Do I need to register all of those numbers or just one number I'm yeah. using to make these marketing calls? Yeah, so you should register each and every one of those numbers. Yes. So all those numbers are used for marketing purposes. Um, you can, you should register all of them, especially because when you call them back and text them and automate and do all that, um, you'll want those numbers registered and your trust score and you to be verified and all that. But yep, that's a good question. Yeah. Funny thing. I, I just got a spam call too. I, <laughs> I, I, I recognize the numbers. I recognize the caller IDs at this point. So we get so many in a day here at the office. Oh, it's it's insane. I mean, it's cell phone, it it's is. office, it's it's nonstop. Yep. It is. And they're they're getting clever with the way that they uh have their phone numbers. It's it's local numbers and numbers yep. very similar to your own cell phone number, which is interesting. Yep. I don't know. Alrighty. So I, next I have a mm -hmm. my area code is not where I live. It's an old number and I've moved around a lot. And you know, so if I see a number that's not saved in my phone from that area code, I know it's spam at that point. It's like, I'm not making new friends and new contacts there anymore. Like, yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's kind of, it kind of helps a little bit, but yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I'm on the do not call list and I still get them all the time. It's, it's crazy. Gotcha. Alrighty. So Mia Smith says, uh, when you're talking about carriers getting involved in blocking, does that only happen with robocalls or can that happen even if you dial yourself? So um, if you dial yourself, that's it's, it's not going to block those necessarily. Um, so if you're manually dialing a number, you're it's not going to like block those calls. Now it still can pop up like potential spam and everything else. So if you're not registered and you don't have your trust score there, um, you're going to be much more likely to be pre-identified as spam. Um, but it, it's not going to like block the call to where like it, you know the other person's phone doesn't ring. Now, if you're doing text messaging or sending pre-recorded messages or ringless voicemails, it, you're, it's probably going to block those from, from getting delivered to them as that protection. But, um, you know, the, the actual manually dialed phone call, it'd just pop up and probably say potential spam or likely spam, what, whatever that is. But, yep. Okay. Yep. All righty. So next question, if you send the text one by one instead of mass texting, is it still illegal? Or are the rules different for one by one? So uh, that, that's a great question, by the way. Um, so the rules are slightly different where it's like a, a automated system just sending out a bunch of text messages, um, especially when, like when you're doing ringless voicemails, like you have to have the written permission first, whether you do them 50 at a time or one at a time, you still have to have written permission regardless. For the text messaging, as long as you're scrubbing the do not call list and they're, you know, that they're, they're basically, you know, as long as they're not on the do not call list, yes, you can send that text message out to them, um, whether it's manual or automated right there. That's, that's not necessarily going to make a difference. The biggest difference is if you're not registered, it's still got the same likelihood of getting blocked, whether you manually do it or um, you know, type it out, whatever. But so if you're not registered, whether it's manually typed text message, automated text messages, the likelihood of that thing getting blocked is, is the same. Um, and the receiving carrier is likely to block it um, on their side. So again, you still have to register and, and, and go that route, whether you manually type it or automate that, yes. Thank you. Okay, Ron asks if you have a recommendation for a skip tracing service or any list providers to get cell phone numbers from property owners, for example. So, um, you know, there, there's several of them out there. We have a sister company called Profit Drive um, that we do skip tracing in. We're actually going to be putting skip tracing inside of ARIA Black Book here, at, I think in the next two weeks or three weeks. So here soon we'll have that inside of ARIA Black Book. Um, but um, there, there's a couple other lists, like there's, what is it? Skip Force is one. And I, I'm sure Anish and Ryan, have yeah, recommendations we on do. that stuff as well. Yeah. We recommend IDI Core, um, especially if you're a BRIA member. And um, if you are a licensed agent, we also recommend Forewarn. If you have any other questions about that, um, mm -hmm. the other Alexa is going to put her chat in for, um, her information in the chat and you could just reach out to us or call our line and I could definitely uh, get you set up with Forewarn or IDI Core. 
So next question from Karen. Um, if you get assigned a low trust score, can you bring it up? And is that assigned to a specific phone number or to the marketer as the whole business? Is it assigned to the number or the business? And so can you bring up that score? It's, it's assigned to both. That's a good question. Um, so that trust score is after you're registered and you send the, the messages and because if you're um, you know, a, a solo investor, your ID number is basically your social security number. If you're having LLC and other stuff, you know, it's, it's going to be your employee ID number, but that, so they're going to track you from a business level and then at a campaign level. So, Hey, I've, you know, Kevin Carroll investments, here's my, my ID numbers, my address. This is who I am as a business. And then I might have three different campaigns, marketing campaigns that I want to basically get pre-approved and pre-registered. So when I do that, I say, okay, here's the phone number or phone numbers that I'm going to use for this campaign. Here are example messages that I intend on sending. And here's basically what I'm going to be doing with it. And so you'll actually have a trust score based on the company as well as the campaign. And then when those two go into a, you know, basically when they're put together, that's what's going to kick out your overall trust score for each one. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. If the lead opts in through an ad, are we allowed to text and do ringless uh, voicemails if they contacted us first? That is a trick question and a great question. Um, so if they've responded to an ad, so for example, if, if you're running a Facebook ad and they click on it and fill out your form, for example, well, as long as you've put the disclaimer on there that you're going to follow up and can use automated text and pre-recorded messages, that's written consent. Yes, you can send them pre-recorded messages to follow up. They've opted in. You could send them automated text messages, so on and so forth. Um, if they've responded from a piece of direct mail, for example, and um, they call in or they see a, a TV ad or a bandit sign, whatever, yes, they've called you. So they've opted in from a phone standpoint, so you can call them back um, and, and send them text messages. But if you don't have written consent, you should not send them ringless voicemails. So the ringless voicemails, you can only send, it doesn't matter if they've opted in or how they've done it. If you don't have it checked on a web form, um, if they haven't come by your office or, you know, or sent you an email saying, yes, I have your permission that th there is a difference there for sure. But yeah, if they've opted in and responded to your marketing and called in, yes, you can call them and text them back. Um, but you can only send the ringless voicemails if you have that on paper written somewhere. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Scott asks, please clarify, does REI Black Book manage and run my outbound calling and texting campaign to keep me compliant with the law? So that is a trick question and uh, that, that, that's a good one. But so we are TCPA compliant. Yes, we do have phone system that does inbound, outbound calls, um, you know, websites and, and the whole deal, full text platform. We have a ringless voicemail platform as well. Um, we get notified pretty much on a weekly basis saying, hey, Alexa over there at Bria, uh, she's not doing it the right way. She's blasting her list and this and this and this, and, and we get <laughs> notified. So we have to reach out and say, Alexa, stop it now. Um, and, and basically, and put those, those pieces in place. But but our system, we've already got a lot of the TCPA safeguards built in, you know, that the hours of, of when the automated messages are going to get sent back out and, and so on and so forth. But when somebody calls in, we automatically save a contact record and we can verify every interaction. So we can say, hey, Alexa called me first. She responded to this ad where she went to my website and opted in here. Um, here's the emails that she sent. So we manage and track all of that. Our system will opt them in when they call in. If they respond back, stop or delete and stuff like that, it will automatically opt them out. Um, so we do have a lot of safeguards and systems in place that will help basically keep you off the naughty list. Um, but no matter what, and I, you know, this is probably a bad example, but I, I kind of equate it to like gun ownership, right? So I can legally own a gun and do the right way. And a lot of people can do that, but some people can still use that tool illegally in a wrong way, no matter how much training you give them and everything else. So we teach and teach and teach. We put safeguards in the system, but 
at the end of the day, you as a business owner, if, if I, I can't prevent you, Alexa, from importing a list of 5,000 people, not checking the do not call list and sending a, a ringless voicemail blast out to all these people and, and you know, have violation after violation technically. Now, you, you may not get in trouble from it. They may You may never hear another word from it. There may never be a fine. There may never be a lawsuit, um, but it's still not right. And, and we can't control you from firing at that one time, but we can definitely stop you going forward if, if, if you get, get us put on the bad list for sure. But uh, good question, trick question. There's a lot that goes into that. And uh, if you need more clarification, happy to address that too. So yeah, that makes sense. All righty. So Alberto says, I use a provider that does my texting through uh, AI and CRM system. Do I have to register my number or should they be the one that has the register? And uh, what is their rule on on that? Yeah. So you need to register your own business and you need to register your own campaigns. Um, that That is on you. Now, your provider hopefully will help out with that because uh, like it can be a little challenging. That's why we're building it out inside of our system. And right now, like our, if you're an active ARIA Black Book customer and you haven't registered or went through this yet, um, you can reach out to me and my team and we can actually help register your numbers on the backside um, as requested. But here very soon, we'll have a forward facing customer facing uh, process and way for you to answer all the questions, register there, Here's your campaigns and numbers, register there, and uh, you can do that all inside the platform. But um, depending on who you're using, you can call them and ask if they have any resources to help. But ultimately, it is on you to register with the do not call. They're not going to do that for you. You have to go to the DNC registry um, and, and figure that out. But they may have some ways to help you. So, Yeah, perfect. And I have a question. So if you are, if you do find yourself in a sticky situation, um, how, what is your recommendation for looking for an attorney or what, what so, certification or experience should they have? Yeah. So, um, you know, local attorneys that are, you know, in your state, in your local markets, always going to be best. Um, but, you know, again, I, I don't, I don't have a list of attorneys or anything by that stretch. Um, just, probably like, I'm sure there's other people like within the RIA and things like that, that you can probably lean on that's helped other investors. And if not, they'll be able to, to, you know, get somebody in uh, referred to you and something like that. But um, I don't have a list. I would just, you know, obviously vet those attorneys, ask some questions and what they would do on here. But um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of help on, on the attorney okay. side of things, but that's I'm fine. sure, I'm sure you've got some contacts at the RIA yeah. there, but. Got it. All right. I will say is, is when you're talking to those attorneys and they're giving you rules and everything else, you know, a lot of times we hear people say, well, I talked to an attorney and they said that I don't have to worry about this and that, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. And it's like, okay, well tell them if, if you get caught or in violation, ask them if they'll represent you for free, if that happens. And that <laughs> usually changes the conversation real quick. And, um, but you know, for what it's worth. <laughs> yeah, that's a tip that works. Alrighty. So Scott says, what are the risks of a new or returning investor making cold calls trying to get their first deal? So the risk is a couple things. Um, the risk is if you are found to violate the TCPA and the Trace Act rules and re uh, uh, legislation, well, there's a $10,000 per violation fine. You can get sued by the recipient um, for actual losses, um, you know, up to $1,500 per violation as well. Um, not only that, if you're not following the rules and calling people and have a low trust score, one, your stuff's going to get blocked. You're going to get marked as spam. So you're going to have lower deliverability. You're at risk for getting massive fines as well as lawsuits. So um, honestly, just scrub the list, make sure that they're not on the do not call list. And if, if, if they're not on there, then yes, you can pick up the phone and call them and, and cold call just like normal. You can still send them letters and, and direct mail and stuff like that. But uh, just, I, I can't stress this enough. Check the do not call list. If they're on the do not call list, don't call them. Don't send them text messages. Don't send them ringless voicemails. If they've taken the time to register themselves on the do not call list, they're going to be much more likely to raise a stink um, you know, try to take action and hold you accountable. And, and like I said, they have four years to hold you accountable. So I can make a, I can do a bonehead move today, calling or texting or doing whatever. 
three years from now, I'm probably not even thinking about that message that I sent today. And somebody can track it. They've got records of it, the carriers and everybody else. So, I mean, seriously, like this can be very, very problematic for investors uh, in a few years from now, because again, the stuff is in place. They know who's doing it. They can track it. And they've got four years to come back and basically hold you accountable. So just, just be really careful. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, that's important. So Karen asks, she has two questions. If we register ourselves and each campaign, is our trust score going to be high just because we registered, even though we may be texting people who have not opted in to receive messages for us? So, so is it automatically um, going to be high? So there, it's, there's a kind of a formula, right? And, and there's algorithms just like a normal credit score and half, half of those may or may not even make sense, right? But, but ultimately after you registered the, the business side and, and you know, really verify who you are as a company and as a person, and then with the campaigns themselves, and again, they're gonna like, you have to give sample messages and, and who you're targeting and what the intention is. And if you do those two things, your trust score is going to be at least middle to high. Um, you know, if it's when you don't register the campaigns and, and change numbers and stuff like that, that's when the, the trust score is going to be low. Or if it's a weird marketing campaign, if like you're trying to sell car warranties and stuff like that, like that's going to be a flag um, just because the likelihood of robocalls and that segment is much higher. Um, but I mean, there's not like a, a black and white, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to have this particular trust score. But for 98% of investors out here, I promise if we just registered our businesses with the DNC and our campaigns, our trust score is going to be high enough to where our messages will get delivered. We're not going to get throttled down and it's probably not going to be much of an impact on our business. And, um, you know, so it, it's that that's probably not quite as important. If you're a massive, massive company and sending out 10,000 messages a day, that's when that trust score gets really, really important. But uh, for, for most of us on this call today, um, just register your campaigns and your business, and that will more than likely take care of everything you need to. All righty. So we're wrapping up here. Just a couple more. What are the times of day we're allowed to call? And is that different for texting? Uh, no. So the rules are the same, whether you're calling, texting or anything else. Uh, the federal rule is 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., but every state has different times. So you have to check with your own state. On that guide that I sent to you, I believe there's a link to showing you each state's times and all that good stuff. But um, um, yeah, so that th that will take care of it. But yeah, the federal law is 8 to 9 p.m. Gotcha. Okay, so how easy is it to track your Google Voice number back to your your number or your personal number? I use Google Voice and not my personal or company number. Yep. So, uh, like just like within inside of RIA Black Book, um, you know, we have a profit dial phone system. So we, you know, somebody might have ten or twenty phone numbers inside of RIA Black Book that we provided. When somebody calls in, it forwards to their cell phone. When they call out, they're still using their cell phone, but their number that they have is the REI Black Book number or the Google Voice number, for example. You would register the Google Voice number with your campaign. So that's the number that's going to show up on their caller ID. That's the number that they're going to be calling you back to. So that is the number that you would register. Awesome. All righty. And someone just wants clarification. Do not call is the same as do not text. Same list. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's just a DNC. Do not call registry. And that takes care of phone calls and text messaging. It's the same thing. Yep. Got it. All righty. That is all the questions for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, very welcome. Kevin. And thank you all of you for participating in this webinar with us today. We uh, had a great time. Kevin, I believe you're going to be back with us on let me check this date i think it is october 13th and you're going to be talking about how to follow up yes um, we, mm -hmm. yeah so uh, i'm pretty excited about that date too because even since we scheduled that uh, time here mm -hmm. a little bit ago we've actually came out with a, a new plug and play system and it, it kind of ties back into this whole tcpa stuff right so like the inbound call routing opt-in process. And then we have uh, automated campaigns that will send off text and email campaigns if they're opted in here. But if we have written permission, it will include ringless voicemail. So we've got some different things that are kind of 
help keep you out of trouble, but still hitting them with as many cross-channel marketing methods as we possibly can. So um, we've got some exciting stuff to share next month for sure. Perfect, perfect. So I hope to see everybody here who on there. Uh, I just sent a link in the chat. The first one is going to be your upcoming event. So you can go ahead and click on that. It's not posted on, on our events calendar as of yet. We're going to get that to you in a moment, but we still have a couple more events in September uh, that we would love for you guys to check out. So thank you so much, Kevin. Um, we had a great time. I wanted to announce the winner. So congratulations yes. to Alberto. You will be having that one-on-one uh, -on -one with Kevin and his team. You're going to be set up with REI Black Book. Congratulations with that. Awesome. Um, if, if yes, awesome. If you uh, love this webinar and you want to see it again, there is so much information. Check out our YouTube channel in a week. I'll put the link in the chat for that. You'll be able to find this again. Uh, Rewatch it. Definitely important stuff, especially if you are trying to grow and market your real estate investing business. So. For all of those, of, for those of you who said you're not uh, in it right now, you're just starting out, when you're ready to go ahead and grow your marketing campaign, check out this video again on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much, everyone, and we hope to see you back again. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.